On today's episode, we interview one of the co-founders of Unbound Merino. They're a four-year-old, four million plus a year in revenue premium men's t-shirt brand that use only Australian Merino wool. A sustainable, ultimate performance fabric that's breathable, odorless, bacteria-free and can be worn weeks on end without being washed. They tell their growth story from zero to a thousand customers, how they launched their brand in Kickstarter and how they grow sustainably via Facebook advertising and email marketing. It's a great episode you do not want to miss. Do stay tuned. Hi, 2Xers. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. And this is the course, well, podcast dedicated to rapid growth in online retail. Now, if you're looking to grow metrics such as conversions, average order value, repeat customers, and ultimately sales, well, what I do is I you know, try and find either experts or people who have actually done it, you know, people who have actually grown businesses, and I get them on to the show. My phone's you know, on, I need to go on um, um, off actually. Well, I get them on the show essentially and um, I, I, I drill them, squeeze, try and get as much, you know, info as possible. Now on today's show, which I'm, you know, very, very super excited about, I have Dan Demiski. He is the co-founder of Unbound Merino. Now Unbound Merino sources ultimate performance fiber, which is Merino, fully natural stuff. You know, you, you know, the Merino um, cardigans and stuff like that. Um, basically they use it for t-shirts and um, just really nice t-shirts that last long. And the interesting thing about Merino walls, wool in general is it, you, you don't, rec- you don't need to wash it that often. They're almost like, you know, a pair of jeans. And um, I, I, I found that, um, a a lot of um, the the narrative around this brand is the fact that you don't need to to, to wash your clothes. And, you know, I haven't actually discussed this with Dan, which we're going to talk about, but there's a really nice sustainability theme to this. And um, we'll be addressing this in this conversation. I think I've babbled a long enough, um, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dan Dembski to to the show. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's it's super awesome to be here. Before we kick off today's show, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Did you know that cloud hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and BigCommerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and BigCommerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores. Install Rewind and get to test it for free over seven days. And to extend the seven day trial to 30 days, head over to rewind.io, their website, and mention 2x e commerce. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So, um, where are you dialing from? And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm in Toronto, Canada. Um... I guess my entire working career, I've been an entrepreneur. I I've had many jobs throughout my, you know, teenage and young adult life, but never a career out. Like I never got a paycheck from a a career job. Uh, since I was on my own, I, I've been working for myself in, in various capacities. Um, Unbound Marino is my fourth business. Um, it's my second e-commerce business. Well, actually it's my third, but the second that I founded, and uh i'm having the time of my life doing it i'll leave you to the questions if you want to get specific but you know (laughs) i'm I'm creating now a brand where uh the product is so authentically something i relate to it's so Mm -hmm. authentically me the marketing for it is easy in that note and i I just love every day and love the hustle of it love the grind of it and i feel like i'm in the right place with this business fantastic fantastic what are your this is a very 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 top level question but what, what are your thoughts about coronavirus and direct-to-consumer e-commerce, which is the space you're in? Well, it's shaken up the entire world and everyone's business. Um, I think that for some people, sorry, just look. Sorry about that. Um, it's shaken up everyone's business. Some businesses have absolutely exploded. Some businesses have completely 
imploded. Some have stayed a little bit static. Um, for us, we're in an interesting place. Being an e-commerce business, this is a good place to be. And e-commerce mm -hmm. is a lifeline for a lot of people through this pandemic because it's the way people are consuming anything and buying all of their goods. The challenge for us is we built this business on the on the back of being a travel product. That was the niche that we selected. Now we didn't need to focus entirely on that that niche, but that was our choice for marketing so that we can narrow our marketing, have a focus, have a yeah. way in. And when people purchase our product for the purpose of traveling, they realize it goes so much beyond travel. The benefits of it are not just for travel, but that's the niche we picked. So when coronavirus hit and the entire travel industry went to a, a, a grinding halt, um, our sales have absolutely plummeted. And it was really scary. Um, so we just rolled up our sleeves and felt, well, what, what is it that we need to do? And we deployed a few strategies. The first was we need to pivot all of our messaging first on our marketing mm -hmm. and then throughout all of the copy on our website and everything to being broader and more general than travel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> and as we did that, our sales started to climb right back up and they climbed back up to where they were before. Now, we're a pretty young company. We've been, had our e-commerce store for about three and a half years now. And we've, we've, ex our sales have accelerated quite a bit year after year. We doubled in revenue from the first, the second, second, the third, uh, zero first. So each year we doubled and our sales all of a sudden plummeted and we got them right back to where they were before. And then we said, okay, well now we need to get really creative. And we started doing all these other things to get our sales to continue to go on the same trajectory they were before. And on that note, I think coronavirus has been really good for us because a lot of the things that we started doing, we could have been doing all along, but we weren't. Mm. Perhaps mm. we were a little bit lazy because mm. our sales were growing quite steadily with what we were doing. We weren't we weren't grinding to figure out what is what's the other what are the other things that we can do. Mm. So we're in a a much healthier position than we were before, but it was at it. We came with a really scary, you know, it I'd must have been really month. scary mm. at first. We're like, wow, we were, we're doing so well and now we're doing terribly. Mm. Um, but you know, the I think everyone knew e commerce was going to continue to grow, but I think it's no, it's, it's, it's jumped ahead 10 years because exactly. of the coronavirus. So, exactly, it's an exciting time to be in this in the world of e commerce for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we're hoping it would stick some of these habits, you know, this, um, you know, co well, customer habits, consumer shopping habits will, will, will stick and, you know, e-commerce will cement itself really in, um, in our cultural, um, you know, um, narrative and structure essentially. Okay. So, um, you guys started out in with a crowdfunding campaign three and a half, four years ago on Indiegogo should we rewind back then? But before that, do you share your revenue figures publicly or is it something you, you keep internally? Um, we're, we're going to do about 5 million us in revenue this year. Okay. So what was the, what was the pathway from zero to, to 5 million over the last three and a half years? What did you do in year one, year two and um, you know, year three? Well, when we were launching this business, you know, we weren't sure, how to get into the clothing industry. We had no previous knowledge or experience with clothing. I mean, I was making some socks in my other business, but you know, making t-shirts is a whole different ordeal. And um, we, so we did a crowdfunding campaign uh, because that was just the way that we could build this concept of a business while we still had our other businesses and jobs. Um, we didn't have the capital to, take a risk and start something new. So it was a way of us finding the product market fit. And it took us about a year and a half. And there's a lot that went into that and a lot that we could go into if you were interested. But at the end of the, at the, end of the campaign, we were trying to get $30,000 in pre-sales. We, we got 300,000. And then in the in-demand phase after, we got another 100,000. So we did $400,000 in pre-sale revenue. And that was, the start to this business. And that did a couple things for us. One, it gave us that capital we needed. Two, it gave us the confidence that we found this product market fit in this new product. And we thought, wow, this is 
I left my other company. I walked away, didn't sell it. I gave it to my business partner. Um, and I said, I'm going all in on this. And that was a risk because I didn't know that this was a real business. Yeah. What I did know is that we had an inkling to think that we might have a real business. We had a, we had a, we had a start. But if we didn't have a website, an e-commerce website, and we didn't have people going to that website, and we didn't have those people buying from our website, we don't have a business. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have the website yet. So I went into this, you know, this almost like a purgatory where I was in between this starting a real business and having a successful crowdfunding campaign. I left my other business. I stopped taking a salary. I had a little bit of savings, which I evaporated very, very quickly as we set up a website and tried to make a go at creating a real business. And in December of 2016, we launched our website and we had a Shopify template we really liked. We took a lot of the photo assets and, and copywriting assets that we had from our crowdfunding campaign and we started to piece it into this Shopify template. And I'll never forget this one morning. We used to meet you know, twice a week in the mornings. We'd go to a coffee shop and I was at a Starbucks with my two other co-founders and we were going to plug some photography into our website template, which was now up. Now we didn't launch the website yet, but the website was now up and running. If you went to unboundmarino.com, it was there. And we were on the back end, and to our surprise, there was at least a dozen orders. People have come to our website. Now we were shocked because we never announced this website. We didn't launch it in any kind of formal launch. Mm -hmm. But people were finding us and buying stuff off us. And we mm -hmm. thought, holy, I can't believe these people are, are mm -hmm. like, this, it was such a shock. So we were at the Starbucks. We ran to our, our storage locker where we had our inventory, which we now had. We've we got to fulfill these orders. So we fulfilled these orders. And that was the start. And from there, it just never stopped. We had, from our crowdfunding campaign, we had this word of mouth finger that was going. And that was what we built the business on. It's mm -hmm. like people like our stuff. They're telling their friends about us. They're coming back to buy more stuff. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the start of our first year and how we took it. So we did a million dollars in revenue in our first year. And mm -hmm. we did that not just on the back of word of mouth and, and, and returning customers. We decided that we needed to focus our energy into one marketing channel. And mm -hmm. we chose Facebook ads because mm -hmm. we kept hearing you know, there was nothing more than that. We just kept hearing Facebook ads are incredibly powerful. It's the best uh, advertising platform the world has ever seen and blah, blah, blah. So we hired a, a consultant we probably couldn't afford mm -hmm. who gave us insane knowledge on how to do crowdfunding. I mean, mm -hmm. not crowdfunding, uh, Facebook ads. Face, Facebook and ads. and uh, our background from our previous business, which was a video production agency, gave us a little bit of a, an advantage where we had the ability to make our own videos and make our own and take our own photography creatives. Yeah. Yeah. We can sort of hobble together some good ads. And one of our, yeah. one of my business partners is a creative director at an ad agency. So he had the confidence to do some really good ad copy. Mm -hmm. So we had that in our tool belt. I don't think you need all that in your tool belt. You can do it without what we had, but it gave us a little bit of an advantage mm -hmm. and we focused all our energy on Facebook ads and it just, went off like we were our return on ad spend was so high you know with so fast that we started to just our biggest problem was we we couldn't hold inventory long enough it was this is 2017 out. right 2017 yeah, yeah. 2017 sorry yeah 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 that's right so yeah. um the biggest problem we had at that point was we were selling our stuff so fast that we had to we we couldn't keep inventory in okay so we'd have, we'd get, we'd irritate people and say, why are you advertising? You don't have enough stock. I want to buy a medium black t-shirt. You don't have medium black t-shirts. So figure out sure. our, all of the challenges that we had started to become good ones, but they were, yeah. we were just selling hand over yeah. fist and it was great. It was so great so how, how, how did you tackle the inventory problem in 2017? We just worked with people who could help us forecast. Mm -hmm. um, we, we worked with one guy, we've sort of built a model for forecasting that after about a year, we realized it was really faulty. We were just still not getting the right things. Hmm. Um, our accountant is a, a good friend. Um, he's very intimate with the business. He started helping us figure out some, some things that we could do to, to better forecast. And 
you know, it's, it's one of the most challenging things in an inventory holding business is to forecast properly because mm. you don't want the mistakes are very costly. And if you buy too much of one thing that you're not selling, all you're doing is taking money that Bad could money. be in a different item that is selling. So it's, it's about really finding the balance knowing what you're okay selling out with. And we're still to this day tinkering with how do you manage that? It's, 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 it's challenging with apparel. So many sizes and colors to, to contend with. And depending where you're sourcing from, we do a lot of sourcing overseas. You're dealing oh. with four month lead times, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, so, was going to ask you about sourcing. Yeah. But go for it. We do, we source, we do uh, a lot of our manufacturing right here in Canada. Mm. We do some stuff in China. We're looking mm. at doing Central America and Vietnam too. Mm. But when we're talking about overseas stuff, when you have a four month lead time, you have to, not only buy enough stuff to that you'll need in four months, you have to anticipate how much are you going to need for the four months that follow that with the growth that you're going to have, because yeah. it's going to take you four months to get in. And then when you place your other order, it's going to take another four months. So having the rhythm and cadence of how often do you order and can meet the minimum order quantities, <clears throat> it is a complete science. And that um, lasts three times a year. You have to get it right those three times or else you'll, you know, you could have a re you have really bad quarters. For us, if we have to have it right consistently throughout the whole year. Yeah. You're yeah, right but, about, I know what yeah. you mean with this, yeah. with the, you know, you can't mess up Black Friday. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, uh, you can't mess up the holiday season. Yeah. Um, but for us, it's like what we notice is if we don't have the right SKUs in and then we have our core products, any one of them could throw off our entire conversion rate. Mm. And that's largely because we sell lots of things in bundles. And that's a really good strategy that we have is, is, we focus on not just selling a single t-shirt, but selling bundles because it raises that average order value. Oh, really value. Yeah. Instead of people buying a single t-shirt, we're trying, we're giving them a, an incentive to buy two t-shirts, two pairs of underwear, two pairs of socks. That's okay. our most popular thing we sell. It's six items. But if we run out of medium underwear, we can no longer sell that bundle to anyone mm. who wears a medium pair of underwear. Mm. And that completely drops our average order value because it's significant and it drops our conversion rate because people look at the things that, well, I would have wanted to buy this bundle and, and we notice it immediately. If we're mm. out of a core item, uh, our conversion rate drops drastically. We see it immediately. Interesting. Let's talk about Merino itself, the, the sure. material. I've always thought Merino was, you know, um, the alternative to cashmere. Um, in term for for winter, so I've always thought to, to to I've always thought about it to be a, a kind of wool that you use to warm yourself up. Um, mm -hmm. Is obviously I'm obviously wrong, you know that that entire impression. No, so, well you're right. So, that is merino wool. Merino wool yeah. is uh, out for outerwear. Okay. Um, you you can have a, a scarf or a winter hat made of merino wool. A lot of people when they come to our website they think that that's what we're selling and we all yeah. it is the same wool but with different weights and different finenesses so mm -hmm. i'm wearing a t-shirt now if you saw me in person you might think i was wearing a cotton t-shirt yes it's merino wool it's super fine merino wool so this is different than the kind of mm. merino wool that you would wear as a like a, a, a thick chunky scarf okay and people think well is it itchy no it's not itchy because no. of the fineness of the fiber is it's finer than that of definitely other wool, but even that of a cotton fiber. So okay. it feels softer than cotton. It feels smooth to the skin. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a wool allergy, this is softer and, 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 and smoother on your skin than cotton is by far. Um, and it's breathable. It's breathable. It's temperature regulating. Um, you know, if you're, if it's hot outside it, the way it, it displaces like the, the, the heat, it moisture wicks away. It actually draws heat away from your body, but it also is naturally insulating when it's cold. So it works. That's a, that's a natural property of wolf for as a defense for the Merino sheep. Yeah. They in, in New Zealand and Australia, this is where the sheep where all Merino wool sheep, all Merino sheep are, or most of them anyway. Um, they deal with some really, really humid and hot temperatures and really, really cold temperatures as well but they have these big coats so the coat is insulating and it's and it's cooling at the same time 
So you're taking that fiber, you're making a t-shirt that performs in that way that these animals deal with the extremities and you're dealing with it on, you know, going on a vacation. And it's literally one of the best performing fabrics. It's all natural. So when people discover that it's not just outdoor winter wear, yeah. sometimes it's mind blowing for them. Yeah. It, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a hurdle to overcome. They have to yeah. say, I, I can't understand why you'd want to wear a t-shirt made of wool but when they wear it they're like wow this is the best material for that interesting ever interesting did you start selling bundles from the get-go since 2017 or sure. um did you implement did you realize that oh you know aov is low um let's let's figure this thing out no well we started doing it because when our crowdfunding campaign the way it works is you have different um tiers so you could sell a t-shirt but you know you if you ever look at any crowdfunding campaign you back this one for ten dollars fifty dollars hundred dollars five hundred a thousand you you build them out so you can have different backers at different tiers of value and what we did is we tried to think well what are the ways that we're going to create things that are 250 dollars or 300 mm -hmm. and it was having more just product bundles. so we okay. naturally just bundled things yep. for the crowdfunding campaign. And then yep. we did a lot of revenue on the crowdfunding campaign on that. We thought, well, of course, this is the way we're going to, you know, also we created packaging to send bundles to, to our first yep. customers. Yeah. So yeah. We set up to do it. It was very natural for us to do that on our website. Yeah. 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 Just carried it over. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. So let's go back to the crowdfunding campaign. What I want us to serve, um, so cover is your crowdfund into today and then um, we'll do the usual stuff. So when, what do you think, how, why do you think the crowdfunding was successful? Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen, analyze, and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x. And did you use any tactics like reaching out to the media um to to generate that or you know get in a few friends and relatives to 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 back the the project initially what did you do that made you absolutely smash your target i mean it was thirty thousand and you did four hundred thousand that's more than 10x 15x mm. or, or thereabouts what was the, I'm sure a lot of people were wondering, you know, how did they do it? We can't brush that out because that was the genesis to what we have today. Well, look, I was in a place in my life where I, I needed this to work. I didn't want, I, I didn't like my other business. I was tired. I was drained. I, if I, if this didn't work, I, I was going to apply for a job, which is something I've never done before hmm. in my work, in my career. I've worked for many jobs as a kid, but like this was, I, I was an entrepreneur from the, from when I was 22 years old and you know, I'm 35 now. So over 10 years and an entrepreneur and I'm like, I'm at, I'm at the end of the road, man. Like if I, if, if this doesn't work, then I don't know what I'm going to do. So I really wanted this thing to work. So we left no stone left unturned when we were planning this thing out. But I, if I had to, to, to look back and say, what were the, the couple things that really made it work the the first and foremost one i would definitely talk about is involving friends and family and it's the reason why you want to do that so we worked with indiegogo not kickstarter and the reason why we picked indiegogo is because them being the smaller of the two platforms they invest a lot more in their customer service so we had an account person that was there to answer questions to help us get this campaign set up with kickstarter they're a little bit bigger they don't really provide that service to new campaigns who have no history with them so what indiegogo made a deal with us and they said if you can reach 30 percent of your crowdfunding goal within the first 48 hours we'll feature you in our newsletter and that's a really really powerful piece of marketing it, we have 
I don't remember how many people they had on their mailing list, but it was, you know, north of 100,000 people. And it's a, tons of people buy from it. So if you're in it, you're going to get a lot of sales. So okay. the big secret is we really needed $70,000 to launch this business, not 30,000. The reason why we went after 30,000 is because it was easier to get 30% of 30,000 than it was 70,000. Yeah. And we figured if we got 30,000, hit 100, we maybe get some momentum and then we get to that 70,000 um, a little bit easier. So what I did for the month leading up to our crowdfunding campaign is I reached out to every single person that I knew that was friend or family or a, an acquaintance close enough that I was comfortable asking them to support our campaign. And I reached out to them all and I just said, in about a month from now, we're going to have a crowdfunding campaign and this is what it's all about. I've been working so hard on this for a year and a half and can I bug you closer to then? Would you maybe be interested in supporting just by buying a t-shirt or something? And for everyone that said yes, I put their name onto a spreadsheet. And then when it was a couple of days before the campaign launched, what I did is I turned on my webcam and, you know, let's just say it was for my buddy, Joe. So I put a vid, my hit record. I'd be like, Joe, so good uh, to have connected with you. I hope you're doing well. This is just to let you know that crowdfunding campaign I told you about, it's launching today. And I know you said that you would support us. Um, I'm not sure if you still can, if you can't, it's totally no pressure, but if you can, it, you know, it would mean the world to me and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I throw in some inside jokes and, you know, I made so many of these videos that I was drinking some whiskey that started getting a little bit tipsy by the end of it. Some of them got crazy, but what this did was instead of me sending you, you've ever gotten an in, inbox message in your messenger or something or email yeah. where it's a friend of yours and Hey, can you uh, vote for me on, on this uh, thing? Or, I yeah. launched this new business. Can you back whatever? And you could tell it's a copy and paste. Yeah. So these messages are so easy to ignore because you know that you, they're not thinking of you. They're just thinking of sending this out to as many people as possible. How many times did you do this? How many how videos? Many, how, how many videos did you make? Probably about a hundred. Whoa. Okay. That's awesome. Did you, yeah, so, was so, this, was this your initiative or did you learn it from somewhere? No, we made this one up and, and, Whoa. and, and, okay. and that's, uh, that's a growth hack right there. Yes. Yes. Because I'll tell you the difference. Instead of getting one of these mass messages, you're yeah. getting a video thumbnail in your Facebook messenger. Yeah. It has your name. So it said joe.mpeg or whatever it said. Or yeah. dot M -O Cause I, I was wondering, cause when you said email, I was like, Hmm, how'd you send a video by email? But now that you say Facebook messenger, everybody wants to play a video on Facebook messenger or WhatsApp. There's a, there's a video with a play button and you see my yeah. face and it says your name. I have, right? to, I have to watch that. You're yeah. at least going to play it. Now, now, if you don't want to support us or maybe it's bad timing financially, you don't want to spend 50 bucks on an, an expensive t-shirt. Um, it's totally fine. But what it does warrant is a response because you know this wasn't a mass message. I personally reached out and I talk to you. I talked to the individual and every single person that said that they would back got a video. A couple people said, listen, I really lo I love what you're doing, but I just, I really shouldn't be spending any money on anything like right now. And I'm, I'm like, absolutely no pressure, you know, no worries, but thanks for responding. But we got those responses, but we also got these, these, these initial orders. So we launched a campaign. We have $0, right? First order comes in, it's my brother, Brian. Second order comes in, it's Sandy. It's my business partner's cousin. And I'm just seeing that little notification from Indigo coming in. I'm like, I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. And then all of a sudden we're at 30%. So now we're like, yes, nine thousand dollars Yeah. Yeah, we got there. Days. I knew, well, we got there in like a couple hours because wow, I had okay. all of these messages wow. blasted out and people started buying them, right? So Okay. We had the big smile on our face at that point because we knew we got the newsletter, but what we didn't anticipate is because we manufactured this momentum, we were now trending on the Indiegogo platform. So now all mm. of a sudden I remember this order came in. It was Johannes in Berlin. And then like, <laughs> I don't know who Johannes <laughs> is. This is a new person, right? Yeah. And then it started happening and we started yeah. selling, you know, UK, 
Germany, Japan. So, so you, you did no press, you know, what the normal Kickstarter launch plan. We started that. getting a little bit of press after that. Um, but we On your own volition or you yeah. proactively or did it naturally come given the fact that you're trending on Indiegogo? It, a friend of mine who ha- works in PR, he made a couple connections, got a couple little things, and then it got it started getting just a life of its own. Like we were okay. pursuing it on our own. We were trending, and then once we were trending on Indiegogo, and the order started rolling in, then the newsletters came out that just added a ton more traffic. Continued mm-hmm. to let us trend, and those were really powerful. Um, at that point, what we did is we retained a company that does. Um, they do ads that drive to crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah. And we started putting some money into that because our, our, our thinking was we're, if we can, we just got to ride the wave of trending on the platform. Mm-hmm. So the, there's an algorithm, which is a combination of people that are buying things, um, people uh, spending time on your page, the amount of people in the amount of inflow into your page, the amount of traffic. So we're like, let's just keep the traffic coming in. And these ads, maybe they'll help us sell some more, which will be good for us. But let's just keep traffic because we want to continue to trend. The longer we trend, it's like surfing. We're on a wave. Let's not let this wave die. So it was a specialized service for, for buying traffic from where? From Facebook, Instagram, or? Yeah, they, they're, they're called Inventus Partners. Inventus Partners. had a different name at the time. And they, that's what they focus on. They focus on ad. They create ads. And they actually created the ads themselves we didn't, they didn't use our ads and we paid them we pay for our own ad budget and then we they work that we give them a percentage of the revenue that they drive okay so based okay. on the utm codes or whatever so sort of like a no-brainer from for us it was not just pay, like acquiring those new customers the real benefit was also the fact that we were flooding our campaign with traffic. tons of traffic yeah. and the traffic lets us trend and if we trend, more people are discovering us and buying us, and we're not paying them for that tra- for for a, a piece of of that revenue. So, how much do you think you spent on on ads or media buying um, over the the Indiegogo campaign, and how long was the Indiegogo campaign? How long? It was did it two look? months, and we spent about I think like fifteen thousand dollars, maybe, okay. Okay. which was like when we made it four hundred thousand. So it was yeah, I, I yeah. and. It was and, and and what kind of commissions did they get? What what did fifteen thousand percent? I I don't remember. I can actually. I wish I came prepared with those numbers because it's been oh, so sorry. long. I have them, but yeah. I don't remember exactly how much they ended up getting paid. But it was twenty percent of what they drove. Yeah. They made some good money and they earned every dollar of it because yeah. Yeah. they it was it was it was a really good spend from us. Um, we nice. still made sure that we were profitable on the orders that we were making with them, but even mm. so. If there's a lot, there's an intangible value to that because of the trending thing. The traffic, like exactly. We maybe, let's just say they drove 50,000. I'm making that up. It's not the number, but let's just say mm-hmm. they drove $50,000 in sales from the 400 or maybe 60,000, whatever it was. There might be another forty, fifty thousand dollars in sales that we got just because of that. They're not getting credited for. Exactly, exactly, and and that, that's that equates to about two hundred and fifty dollars a you know a day in spend, which is not bad at all for for the returns. <clears throat> okay, um, so that's out of the way. Let's talk about year one. You, you talked about the evolution of you know where you are. So year one was primarily performance marketing on the Facebook and, you know, Instagram advertising platform. And then, you know, all, all through now you've evolved to, you know, more word of mouth. Your products are fantastic, which is natural to, you know, bring word of mouth and repeat customers and also SEO. So I'd like to talk about, you know, Facebook advertising. You, you said you hired an expert that um, sort of taught you the ropes. Um, did you put it in house? And um, if you did, what strategies did you put in place to, to really get, you know, Facebook going up to the point that you were seven figures in 12 months. We did it all in house. So we hired a, we, this guy came highly recommended from a, a, another entrepreneur here in Toronto who runs a, she runs a, a business that's, it's in clothing too, much more successful than we were at the time, much more successful. Like they're huge now. Okay. Um, and she recommended this guy, what's, but what's what's the brand name? It's called Nick Swear. Nick Swear, okay. 
they were, I, I looked up to her in so many ways because she, she felt like she was me, but six years ahead, she started mm. the crowdfunding campaign. Her crowdfunding campaign was bigger than mine. It was over a million dollars. Um, okay. They're just, she does women's intimates, like, you know, comfortable, like bras and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, she came into my life, just blew my mind with, inspiration and advice and it was like a, it was like I, I i just happened to be at a dinner with her and just like it was like the greatest mentorship ever um but she introduced me to a, a consultant who, did, who taught facebook ads he was way too expensive for us but i got on the phone with him and said yeah we'll plan to get going with you maybe at the end of the year and he talked about how immediate the returns for facebook ads were and how it's like it's more expensive as he was and we were paid him $5,000 for two phone calls. Each were an hour. So I paid him $2,500 an hour for his advice. Wow. I've never imagined paying anyone that much money. <laughs> but he convinced us that it was worthy because he said, you're going to know that this works within a few days. This is not like something that would trust me and wait a few months. It's like, we're going to get you fired up. We're going to get your ad set up. We're going to do this on the phone together. And you're going to start seeing the returns. So I'm like, and I just, his claims were so bold that I'm like, let's just roll the dice on this. So, Do you remember his name? Yeah. Rob Green. Rob Green. Okay. He's a, he's a genius. Um, with, I haven't, I haven't worked with him in a very long time in a couple of years. Okay. Um, but, uh, and he's probably a lot more expensive now, but mm -hmm. he's worked some magic for us. So, okay. um, yeah. So, so you got on the phone with him. So, we got on the phone with him and he just taught us everything that we need. And there's some things that we learned. Like, you know, at first he's like, look, you know, sometimes it's the, the click more clickbaity claims and ads are, are the things that work. You know, we maybe wouldn't want to have ventured down that path. You know, some of the ad style that we had, it was a little bit more like be a little loud in your claims, be a little bold in your claims, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that works. It works for a reason. So, and he would do a lot with us of showing us like good tactics on how we can sort of A, B test different creative, how to throw ads into the platform so we could sort of get a, a strong feel of what's working, what's not working. And little insights of, you know, we started to notice that a lot of the people that were buying off us were a lot older, you know, they were, you know, closer yep. to 50 years of age. That could be a Facebook thing. So with him, we came up with little tactics. Like here's like one example is, we said, well, look at the model that we're using. This guy, he's a young man with a man bun, you know? Mm -hmm. And he looks like a little hipster traveler kind of guy. But the people that are buying are not these, they're not this guy. They're older. Let's go find an older model. So we found a model that was closer to 50 years of age, you know, a silver fox man with gray mm -hmm. hairs. And uh, the second we launched that ad, our ad performance was blowing up. I mean, it was that an ad with a man who was of the age that was closer to the people buying our product yeah. had almost double the return on ad spend immediately. Mm -hmm. So we just had like the, the right way of looking at things and making the right decisions. And that was a heyday with Facebook. I mean, Facebook ads don't perform like the, these days the way they did before. Mm -hmm. Um, but back then, you know, we were seeing, you know, we're getting return on ad spend, you know, it started at like three, then it went to four, five, six, up to seven return on ad spend. So every mm -hmm. dollar we're putting in, we're getting six or seven dollars back. Fuck. And we were jacking our budgets up. And this is when we started, it just started to sort of explode. We started selling just a ton, just a ton. And our biggest problem then was keeping things in stock. We were like begging our suppliers to like, rush our orders get it in we're air shipping everything in you know we're manufacturing more stuff locally in canada just to reduce the lead times um we couldn't bring the stuff in fast enough and that was on the back of facebook ads and figuring it out mm -hmm. very 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 fascinating yeah those were the heydays but they also found uh, they they also gave you the foundation to, to to trigger that word of mouth and retention marketing because the products were so good yeah, um, so there, that's, you hit on something there, you know, mm -hmm. through this all, you can learn about how to be an effective crowd funder and Facebook yeah. advertising and all that. Yeah. That's just getting you a sale. Yeah. The most important thing is the quality of the product. 
because mm-hmm. that's uh, returning customers is, is how you're going to build a sustainable business and word yeah. of mouth, yeah. not on just continuing to, if you have a bad product, you're duping people. Exactly. So our, our, I actually think that our, some of our clickbaity ads don't align with how good, like it feels almost like cheapening how good our product is mm-hmm. at times. That's how I felt, but yeah. we learned what's effective for Facebook advertising. People will buy our stuff and then the product speaks for itself. That's very important. Yeah. That's the most important. And, and, and how do you it, empower the, the customer to, to share that experience? You know, um, they, they've got lovely Merino breathable light, you know, um, you know, fabrics or clothes that do not need to be washed for a while. How do they share the experience on your own terms? Well, here's the thing. Mm. It's not, it's, it's on their terms. You mm. know, we haven't figured an app or a, we haven't done a lot where I can say, here's some marketing strategy that we got to get people to share more. Like we try to do some referral stuff. If you, we have on our website now. So if you refer a friend, they get a $25 gift code and you get $25 if they buy something. Right. So that stuff works a little bit, but at the end of the day, we're selling a pretty expensive t-shirt and it's expensive because not because it's, we're trying to be some up market brand and charge more than what it's worth. It's because the material is very, very expensive. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Did you know that cloud hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and big commerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and big commerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores. Install Rewind and get to test it for free over seven days. And to extend the seven day trial to 30 days, head over to rewind.io, their website, and mention 2x e commerce. It's expensive for us to make, so it's expensive for the consumer to buy. Um, when people buy a plain t shirt, like the one I'm wearing right now, yeah. But this t-shirt is more than just a t-shirt in the sense that it solves, it has like a real benefit to the, to that person. So, yeah. you know, back in when traveling was a thing before coronavirus, when I travel, I can pack just a carry on because I only need to bring two or three t-shirts and I try, and then you're, you're only traveling with your friend and he has a big suitcase and it's sitting waiting on the luggage carousel and the luggage goes missing and, or, you know, all of these problems that come with traveling with like lots of stuff or the annoyances there within, they want to talk about it. They yeah. want to share. Like, it's like, it's like, it's, it's not like, you know, you're wearing a shirt with your podcast name on it, right? Yeah. Some people like to wear a shirt that says Supreme because they want to show everyone they spent $200 on a stupid t-shirt. And that's my opinion. I think it's yeah. dumb yeah. Yeah. because you're overpaying for a not great quality thing just because you want to identify. But when you're wearing a shirt that has no visual branding, but it really has a lot of inherent value in it and that benefits you as an individual, people love talking about it. They say like, look, it's like, I just bought this shirt. It was was expensive, but it's incredible. Like the way it performs in hot temperatures and cool temperatures. I just pack less stuff. I don't need to wash all the time, which also makes it last longer because the re- you close a road yeah. because you throw in the laundry laundry machine and dryer and it just beats it up. Yeah. This yeah. is like a way of, uh, of, of, you know, you have a shirt, it fits the way that it originally did the, like the first time all that's like for much longer because it is the first time you put it on. You're not, it's yeah. not, it's not going through the laundry machine and getting beaten up and tossed around. Yeah. So there's a, there's so much to talk about and people love talking about it. So yeah. we make the customer service experience really good. Um, we work really hard at that. We are really obsessive about the product quality because we need it to be that good. It comes in a really nice package, a nice box. It feels premium. Some people say it's like, I felt like I got a new iPhone when I got your, you know, well, it's not, so it's you've... not like, it's not that good of a package. Mm-hmm. It's a nice box that it comes in and we put like a, a nice little booklet and we package it. And it is a very nice experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like, how does the iPhone pull? Well, you know, when you've opened that iPhone box, mm-hmm. but there, we just give people that experience so that it's, it feels like something special for them. And then the product speaks for itself. 
and yeah. they want to talk about it. So there's a lot of utility in, in the product and, you know, people, you know, um, get that value um, out, you know, when they, they appreciate the value, it, it does match their expectation. You know, once they, they splash that much on, on the items and they, they, they get everything back and more when they see the product and, and that you know, um, probably triggers them to want to tell others, you know, about, you know, how great the product is. Okay. So, um, let's talk, so let's finalize on, on Facebook, which is you've been advertising on Facebook for almost four years. What principles, um, if you were to look at them as pillars in, um, for, um, the success in the return of a Facebook or an Instagram ad, what, what core tenants, um, actually hold, um, would actually would apply to anybody listening um, to, to implement in in on, on in their stores um, in or their brands in regards to Facebook advertising. So, if you are going, to, here's my advice: if you are going to be launching a new business, I think you are better off if you aim to launch a business where the price point of the product is higher. I'm. I think if you're going to be creating a, a business where the product is, you know, 10 bucks or something, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to convert on Facebook with a lower, like a lower price point product, but it's still not easy. So you might be spending $10 to acquire a new customer for a $10 product. And that's a losing proposition because of the nature of our product being expensive and how, that we bundle it all our average order value is closer to $200. So when we Facebook advertise, you know, our, our cost to acquire a new customer used to be like 20 bucks. It's gone up quite a bit, but even when we get, gets up to $50, which is very expensive with the cost of goods sold, it's still, we're at worst break even, but we're usually profitable, even with spending that much money to acquire a new customer. I think it's important to consider what the cost of acquiring a customer is and how that fits into the math of what your cost of goods sold are and everything. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, it's gone up quite a bit over the years. So expect it to be expensive and factor that in, you know, if you have a good quality product, you're willing to like for us, it's like, if we broke even on a new customer, it's totally fine. Cause we know that what our returning customer rate is, we know what the, you know, how the value of word of mouth, we know that the, they're going to love our product for the most part. Not everyone does, but for the most part, people love, love our product. So you have to get into the game thinking that you're going to spend a lot on Facebook because that's just the landscape now. And yeah. does your business model permit you to spend that kind of money? Be it because you're, it's an already an expensive product and you're still profitable. If you're a self-funded business, that's the, the place where you need to be thinking. If you have funding, some people go so far as they take a loss on Facebook ads. That's very common. Yeah. We don't have any investors. We don't have outside capital. We run all on our own sales. So for us to lose money is just not what we're interested in. Yeah. But that's a very common thing and that's what you're up against. So I always urge people when thinking about, if they're thinking from starting something from scratch, it's like, it's one of the things I would always default to is let's go after having a high price point product. Yeah. 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 And, and also, you know, factoring in that customer lifetime value, you know, how, how quickly is this customer on average going to come back to, to buy again? Um, so that they're, they're a lot more valuable. Um, what about email? What, what, what are you guys doing on the email front at the minute? Well, email is the absolute best thing that what, we have. What, what do you use for, for, for email Clavio. What platform? Okay. They sponsor this podcast. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, they're good. That's not a, they're not paying me to say that they're, yeah. they're a, a, a great platform. Um, so, so how do you use Clavio? How big is the list today? Our list has gone, it's, it's over 50,000 people now. And that's mm -hmm. all that's, that's customers and people that sign up on our, on our website that, but most of have been customers. Um, we haven't been aggressive with our email marketing. Mm -hmm. we've been gotten more aggressive with our email marketing once coronavirus hit when we were starting to think we need to rely on all of the, the different channels that we have. 
And we avoided it for a while because we didn't want to be annoying and we didn't want people to unsubscribe from our list. That's a fair. (laughs) Yeah, overbearing. We wanted to be just like, when it was important to email or was a big product announcement or things of that sort. When coronavirus hit, we started with Klaviyo. We started doing all these Klaviyo flows. So a customer win back, they haven't come in six months. So we're going to send them a gift code. Um, we think that our, the underwear, the boxer briefs we make, we do, we legitimately think they're the best boxer briefs on the market. So anyone who's bought any, anything off us, but have not bought underwear, we have an email flow that will show them how great our underwear is or suggest yeah. how great our underwear is. So we started doing a lot more of that and we started doing weekly emails. Um, if we, there are certain emails we send that before we send it, we know this is going to be a record sales day. Like we mm-hmm. know because the email list is that powerful. So uh, for all of the Facebook advertising that we've done, anything you'll do on Instagram, uh, all of the SEO efforts, everything you do, nothing compares to your email list. It is, there are people that have, are interested in your product or have already bought it and it's a direct channel of communication to them. Mm. Um, so we're getting a lot more serious about how we use it, but still with the fear that we don't want to, we don't want to tire it out. We don't want to be one of those companies where it's like their email comes in and you don't want to open it because yeah. there's many of those. Yeah. And I just always, this is the way I think, you know, through any lens, I always just think it's like, sometimes people get so wrapped up with the mechanics of running a business that they forget that all that matters is what's going on in between the ears of the customer. Like, it's not like, like you could talk about Shopify apps and like strategy and all this stuff. It's like, just pull back, remember what it's like to be a customer and then just reflect on that and and execute based on like what you would want to be bombarding you in your inbox or not as a customer. And I find a lot of brands, I've, I sign up to a lot of mailing lists now because I'm just curious as to how they do their marketing. Yeah. And like some of them, like I don't even want to open them anymore because I'm like, it's yeah. just junk, right? Yeah. So we're always trying to walk that line between it's like, how much can we send that it's effective yeah. without us becoming junky? Yeah, I'm actually quite surprised as to one angle you guys haven't really tapped into. And, and I think it's a, it's a really core, um, it's really core to the essence of your brand. And that's a sustainability you know, bits of things. I would think um, the sourcing of, of, of Merino wool is sustainable. Mm-hmm. You're not, you know, um, you're, you're not impacting on, on land. Um, you're not, it's not as intrusive as cotton. Yeah. And the um, production of it is, is, is much more environmental because you're not using you, the, the heavy you chemicals. You, you, exactly. You don't get to wash your, your um, you, the amount of water used to maintain your garments. We never think about the amount of water we used to clean our clothes. Um, you know, it's not required. And these things last, you know, the, the, the garments actually last longer. Um, so if you look at a normal t-shirt, you know, how long does a normal t-shirt last? You know, a couple of months, yeah. you know. And they're and biodegradable. They're biodegradable. So there, there's that sustainable theme and there's a yeah. massive market of, you know, um, environmentally conscious customers that, you, you know, will buy, you know, based on, you know, all those credentials, essentially. Um, so yeah. Have well, we do, we, we, we don't focus our, our, we don't make it the, the core focus of our brand. Like we don't mm. make a lot of things the core focus of our brand, but mm. if you go on our website, you can see all the certifications. Oh, okay. You could see that we, I mean, it's very important to us. Mm. Um, but our strategy, it's like, so, you know, one of our, our core values is less, but better. And that transcends through everything we do, but when, I'm just going to relay that to our, 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 approach to marketing Mm. it's we're not trying to you know slowly we're going to roll out more angles for marketing but Mm. we found that we were better served by concentrating our efforts on more narrow marketing so that's why we focus so much of our energy on travel which we were forced to switch out of we could focus our energy on sustainability but we find it's better as a footnote for us Mm. because we got we really think we're solving um, an immediate and clear need for our customers mm. with the traveling because the art we're, we're targeting people they're going they were going on trips mm. this will help them right now and mm. then our customers like we, we we know them pretty intimately i've even gone 
on the phone with many of them. Did we do a little surveying stuff like that? We're trying to figure out like who is really buying our stuff. They're really smart people. Mm. And they don't, they, sometimes they're buying the stuff as, wow, this is a solution to my travel woes and it makes things easier. But they know that like once they buy it, they're looking a little deeper. So, well, this is not just about travel. This mm. is about lifestyle in general. And I like <laughs> that this is sustainable. I like buying something I know doesn't have the same, uh, hold the same weight on the environment that mm. synthetics do, which are, are really burdensome to the environment. Mm. They're not biodegradable. The manufacturing process is burdensome to the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they figure this out on their own and we let the information be there for them. But one of our strategies has always been, let's narrow our marketing. Let's not try to market. Well, it's so good. It's environmental. It's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. It's like yeah. we pick a niche and we laser focus and that's helped us be more effective. Okay. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. My, I think our final touching point um, before we, we get into lightning round is your SEO strategy. You talked about um, SEO taking time. Um, how did you approach it? You know, who did you talk to in the industry before you, you know, you, 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 you got started? I was, a partner, I was a partner in a, a company, Dbrand Skins, and we did uh, tremendous stuff with SEO. Uh, um, I, I used the, so we had a guy that we used. Hmm. I'm, I don't have a secret sauce. I don't have, I'm not the mastermind behind the SEO. Hmm. I just knew early on, I said, we're going to invest in SEO and it's going to do nothing for us for years. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I said to my partner, I said, we're going to start it out. Um, we'll ramp up the budget, you know, every quarter a little bit, but let's just, plug that money into SEO and we don't think about it for two years. Trust me here. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen, analyze and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x. And they agreed and we hired a great SEO guy and that's, that's it. We don't, I don't have any more to say to that other than it's a worthy investment. You find a guy who, who's good, invest <laughs> in it and let and give it the time. And that's all we did. Who's your guy? That I can't share because it was. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I see. I see not because I, I'm an open book. I would share anything, but because <laughs> he came from the other company and I don't want to okay, 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 divulge his, because okay. he's very, very much was a part of like the growth. And he's, uh, he, you know, if anyone, if anyone, if anyone emails me or you, 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 me up, no I'll tell, I can okay. connect, I'm happy to connect the business to him. He's yeah. a, he's just a, he's, you, he's a, he's a phenom. I love him. Awesome. 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 You seem to be, um, so your, your, your homepage focus is Merino wool clothing, Merino wool apparel, you know, which is quite interesting in itself. Well, your, your website looks really, really premium, you know, really well done. Um, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about, finally, let's talk about the tech stack. You know, what does your tech stack look like? Um, you're obviously on Shopify. You mentioned Clivio. Are there any other, um, apps that um you know are indispensable you know um technology solutions you're you're using to to run on bound marino no none uh, you named the two that are indispensable so here are the three things we touched we touched on a depth in depth indiegogo shopify clavio without yeah. those three <laughs> we'd be in a completely different place but there are others um I think we use one called Inquire, which is like a post uh, purchase survey. Um, Refersion we're just starting with, which is like for affiliates, but we haven't had a very strong affiliate program yet. We're just starting with that. Um, I want to tell you what I honestly think about the tech stuff. Yeah. I feel that there some of the, if you could use the tool really well, then yeah. it's worthy, but the tools don't solve any problems. I think what, mm. what matters is the quality of your product and yeah. your ability to market it. Like that's yeah. it. And you don't need apps, right? Sometimes people get too focused on the apps mm. and it 
it distracts them from like having like a really, really strong business model, which is having the channels to sell the product and having the good product or service. I so, 100% agree with you. So, so I, I was, when, when I, I was, I was thinking about, I knew you were gonna ask this question. So I was thinking about what are the apps that really matter? And I, and I, and I just sort of jotted a few of my notepad here, stamped reversion and choir Clavio, obviously Shopify. Um, yeah. but I don't feel like passionate about, I mean, and, and this is not in any way a diss the apps. Those are good apps Inquire provides good information to us. Um, but what matters is your own ability to market and your own ability to create a good product. That's it. So yeah. that's Amazing. kind of a bad answer. Maybe. No, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely spot on and it, it gets you to really think and be product folk driven. I mean, right. And then when companies- you get an app. When you get an app, the app could really do tremendous things for you, but just don't think it's the solution. It's just yeah. a tool. It's just yeah. a tool. And it's almost better to ignore the apps until you really think it's like, like we really, really want to drill into like what, like we're, you know, we have enough customers now. Like what are the real things that we need to know after they purchase? Where did mm-hmm. they hear from us? Like that way we can make better decisions on how to spend our money. But we're at a place now where we're getting enough orders where it's like, it's significant enough, the data that we'll get back that we'll make real decisions based on exactly. where we're going to spend our, like, like our people, um, like, should we advertise on podcasts? Like we're going to mm-hmm. do, we'll, we'll, we can now test a little bit of that. And we have a post-purchase survey to find out did that, was that actually effective for us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, we're now getting to the point of the real use and the real value of it. But until you have, a real inclination that there, this thing is going to be of value to you. If you're not hundred percent sure, it's probably just a waste of time. Just focus on your marketing, just focus on your product. Okay. Finally, is, is there, do you, do you foresee tapping into other marketing channels beyond um, your, your website, your Shopify website? Well, sorry, I don't understand the question. Do, like, do, do you foresee selling through oh, other like, channels? Like Amazon or something? Not necessarily, yeah. I'm, not necessarily Amazon. It could be like retail, uh, retail stores, you know, yeah. with a retail partnership offline, stores, pop-ups, anything. We have zero interest because, you know, I've been in a complicated business before. My other business mm-hmm. was, I, I had to work, you know, if I wanted to be really successful, 12 plus hours a day, seven days a week. And, and, and we're trying to create a business model that is, you know, again, going back to the less but better core value that we have, yeah. um, the way I look at re- retail and wholesale, it's like, why would I create more complex relationships to sell things at half the price for wholesale, mm. right? And then having to stock them with the right image. It's like, it's like I'm like, there are so many brands and, and you know what coronavirus hit and like, look at all these wholesale accounts for all these brands. It's like, for me, it's like, let's just focus all our energy on direct consumer. Never have to worry about having wholesale relationships. I never have to wine and dine the big buyer from this store or whatever. Like, no, let's just acquire customers, build our mailing list. It's simpler. And I, and I think sometimes less is better. So that's exactly. our strategy. The only place we're considering a retail is in Toronto because we're here and we get a lot of emails of people wanting to come to our warehouse to try clothing on. And mm-hmm. we don't, we're not, we're not set up for that. Like if you come to our warehouse, it looks like a warehouse. We have desks there where we work and we hang out and we love that. We love the space, but it's not a place where you want to bring a customer in. It's not a customer experience. Yeah. So we're thinking about having one retail lo- retail location, not our own, but just for now, like maybe we'd get into a store in Toronto so that customers in Toronto will stop e- emailing us to try on t-shirts. That makes sense. Makes sense. Other than that, we have zero interest. We'll be entirely e-commerce, and it's fine. We sell, as I said, in over a hundred countries. We don't need to have retailers. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Great, great, great answer. And um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing strategy. D 2 C is 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 where it's at. It's where okay. it's at. Yeah, it's why absolutely. it's why e-commerce is alive. Uh, exactly. To actually e-commerce. All right. Okay. So Dan, um, I'm tremendously. Um, you know, just appreciative of you giving us, you know, so much value. You've been, you've been an open book. Um, you've shared a ton, but before I let you go, um, I'd like you to, um, you know, um, just participate in our lightning round if, sure. if you, and, uh, the format of it is I'm going to ask you a, a question and if you could, you know, use a single sentence to answer each question, it'd be brilliant. All right, let's do it. All right. Lightning. 
Okay. So what advice would you give yourself five years ago? Never get comfortable because comfortable, get comfort is laziness. Mm. Are you a morning person? Trying to be more of one. Uh, what's your daily morning routine like? I wake up, I sit on my pillow, I meditate for 20 minutes. I have a thing called the five minute journal. It's a gratitude thing. I fill that out. So I start my day with 20 minutes of calm stillness and a little bit of gratitude. And then I make my bed like the way that it would be made in a five-star hotel. <laughs> you're, you're I, feel, I feel what those three things, I already started with three wins. Mm. And starting the day with wins is a good momentum to start with. Mm -hmm. What two things can't you live without? I can't live without this little guy right here, yeah. my dog. Um, <laughs> Bless him. I, I'm pretty simple. I, I, you know what? The only thing that I really, really care to purchase and have in my life is good quality food. I like eating fresh, good food. Um, I'm a big eater. That's all I need. I need, a, I need good food and lots of water and the rest I can be happy with. Mm. What book are you currently reading? Um, I'm actually rereading a book for the fifth time, Getting Things Done. Okay. Getting Things that's, Done well, is a, the art of stress-free productivity. I, I feel that I've fallen a little off the wagon in this book. Every time you read it, it sharpens up your, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, pl a program that you can have for being productive. But what I'm doing this time, so I have the book, the, the actual regular book I've read a few times, but this time I got Getting Things, here's an interesting thing I learned recently. Mm. If there's a business book you like and it's popular, there's likely, sometimes there's a version for kids or teens. Mm. So I got getting things done for teens and it's the exact same content, but it's about half the length, maybe a third of the length, simplified into simple language. Because sometimes these business books, it just keeps yeah. going, blah, blah, yeah. blah, yeah. blah, yeah. blah, yeah. blah, yeah. blah. So I'm reading getting things done for teens. Interesting. And that's, because it's the first time I'm reading this version of it and that's to sharpen up, um, Sharpen the old knives on my productivity. I will check it out and link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Dan Tomiski, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I had fun and it was great chatting with you. Appreciate Cheers. the opportunity. Cheers.